anger on the Atlantic over a green energy plan of giant proportions. It was the fishermen were the last ones to even find out about it. They say Titanic towers like these could cut into prime fishing spots. There should be a lot more research. But there's a major push to proceed. It's goodbye, fishermen. Hello, windmills. So Canso, Nova Scotia needs a big money project like this, but many don't want to endanger the ancient trade that sustained it for generations. Tom Murphy breaks down the promise of the turbines and the fears of fishermen. <laughs> The race to get green is on. Dirty coal, fossil fuels are on the way out. By 2030, 80% of Nova Scotia's energy must come from renewable resources. It's a big ask. But ready to swoop in is Nova East Wind, an international joint venture. It wants to build massive offshore floating wind turbines, a Canadian first giving the problems a chance to maybe become a green energy powerhouse. For generations, Nova Scotians have looked to the sea for solutions. This time, there are headwinds. What's going on, buddy? You got a faller? Yeah. Yeah. This is Canso in northeastern Nova Scotia, where Billy Bond and many before him have fished for more than four centuries. He does. It's a nice looking fish. Lobster, halibut, shrimp, snow crab, and yes, on this day, bluefin tuna. Beautiful fish, man. That's the most beautiful thing that swims in the ocean. Those huge wind turbines, the plan is to put about 25 of them, at least to start, in about 150 square kilometers of ocean where these men fish. So, for comparison, here's the Eiffel Tower, about 300 meters tall. The blades on the turbines, they'd be longer than football fields. And the whole structure actually floats while being anchored to the ocean floor. It would be a roughly $2 billion mega project. Now, Canso has seen other big industries promise big things for this region over the years, only to have them fade away. There's nothing else here except for the fishery. Back in port, Bond says this time, he fears for his livelihood. But I'll tell you, down here in this, this neck of the woods, they sure like part, trying to put us out of business. So you got a lot of questions. A lot of questions and no answers. Because you know why? Because it was the fishermen were the last ones to even find out about it. So what worries you the most about the offshore wind turbines? The fishing the fishing grounds. Some people will say it's a big ocean out there. We got to go where the best fish is. Sure, there's lots of bottom out there, it's a big ocean. But it's not everywhere there's fish. And this area here would, is the area that has been surveyed. So they organize. Ginny Boudreau is executive director of the local fishing association. She's fighting for the whole process to be slowed. Because five years ago, if I had put my finger as a fisherman, as a harvester, on the map as to where I'm fishing a particular species or where I was fishing five years ago, my finger can't go on that spot today because I am over here or I'm over there. The ocean is warming. Fish species are moving. There should be a, a lot more research. There should be a lot more consultation. And I think that in order for that to happen, we need a set of regulations. Are you surprised by how quickly this thing is picking up speed? Oh, it, it's, it's unbelievable. We're working on the regulations, governments say. In the meantime, they push on, holding public information sessions like this one across the province. I understand their concerns. I grew up in Guysborough County. Jerry Sheehan of Nova East Wind, himself the son of a fishing family near Canso, encourages the government to move faster, even if there are still some questions. With respect to how much access they'll lose, um, today that's not known. Um, and the reason it's not known is the regulations are being developed as far as what fishing activity could happen within a wind farm, for example. Um, we're actually supportive of that. 
as long as the activity can happen safe and it won't harm the infrastructure, we don't want to do anything that's going to impact their livelihoods. And Sheehan argues an offshore wind project of this scale could even spawn a whole new parallel industry here by capitalizing on the wind resource. We've got one of the best wind regimes in the entire world. You're able to get a lot more power, in some cases five to five times more power out of one single unit compared to an onshore turbine. The thing that we really want to have is the first project. We believe that the first project will kickstart the industry, so I'm very confident that we can build offshore turbines here. But of late, some offshore wind projects are having a hard time staying afloat. High interest rates and supply chain problems are driving up costs, killing projects. Especially in the last couple of years, Chris Nizraki of the University of Maine says the floating offshore wind industry is having growing pains. And so some of the developers are actually backing out of agreements because they're not cost effective. Some of these companies are walking away because the cost have escalated and they're trying to re renegotiate those prices. So uh, for offshore wind, it's more expensive than land-based wind. That's, that's for sure. The benefit is that you're not use, utilizing land resources. Offshore wind projects have existed in Europe for decades. So could the two industries share the ocean off Nova Scotia? As far as you know, fisheries goes and those impacts, I think overall that the impact is fairly limited. It's very busy actually. On the wharf for Billy and others, their fear is anchored in their survival. Oh, uh, I think without a doubt, it'll probably get bigger and bigger, and the fishermen will get less and less. It's goodbye, fishermen, hello, windmills. You're not against green energy, though? Absolutely not. You just don't like it on the fishing well, grounds? I actually have a car ordered with electric motors, so I'm definitely not against green energy. What do you want? I, it's, I, hey, if they're going to take my living from me, I want something, along with every other fisherman here. Have they talked to you at all about compensation? Absolutely not. That's what do you a, think of that's, that? that? I think, I think with, the, with the government, it's a curse word to them. So for now, they fish. Exactly what's on the horizon, no one really knows. So Tom, that's interesting. Is there no clear picture of what compensation may look like? Well, you know, there's, there's no talk of government compensation, at least at this point, but there certainly is talk of more wind turbines. The Nova Scotia government has identified two bays, even closer to shore, as potential locations for wind farms. The fishermen, as you might imagine, are fighting that as well. So it certainly seems that Atlantic Canada is, is really ideal for these sorts of wind farm projects. Well, exactly. Experts say the wind is strong and it is consistent here. You put that together with deep waters close to shoreline communities that need electricity. Well, they say this region is really almost perfect. And Adrian, in the winter, when Canada's demand for energy is greater, that's when the winds are the strongest. Of course. All right, Tom Murphy in Halifax, thank you. Thank you. Now for a quick look at something we're bringing you tomorrow about the reality of war with help from a visitor to Gaza who now finds himself staying put in the face of fear. We've received news that um, everyone in Gaza is to depart Gaza by 5 p.m. The view of a man who made a most extraordinary decision. British national Mohamed Galayani, an air quality scientist from Manchester, he was in Gaza on vacation when the war started, was permitted to leave through Rafa weeks ago, but he didn't go. Compelled, he says, to stay for a few weeks now, he's been documenting daily life in Gaza for us. Hi, this is Mohamed Galayini. It's November 2nd. The big and little decisions that can sometimes make the difference between life and death. This is the Khanunis High Street. I don't even know what happened here. Days and nights in Gaza, tomorrow on The National. Coming up, the award-winning CBC series, Sort Of, is coming to an end after three seasons. I mean, part of what I'm curious about is what happens after Sort Of.
Jackson Weaver sits down with the show's star and co-creator. That is next on The Breakdown. As a trans TV star, Bilal Bag broke ground and opened doors. I was going to press the buzzer, but I didn't want to bother you. How long have you been standing here? Their CBC series sort of is acclaimed for authentic, layered characters. So deliciously flawed, and they make mistakes. But now that it's ending, what will its legacy be? What are the shows that get made? Who gets to be heard? Our entertainment reporter, Jackson Weaver, nice to see you. I know you've uh -huh. been following Blau Bag's career for, for quite some time. Uh -huh. I'm curious, successful show, um, critical acclaim, uh -huh. why end after three years? I mean, that's a great question. Many people have been asking that. Bag could have ridden the high of being the co-creator and the star of the show easily, but they felt that the show had naturally reached its conclusion. And they also are very shy and do not love the spotlight. I actually got to speak with them about a year ago. Back then, they weren't able to uh, recognize the impact that the show had had. And I was very curious to see whether that had changed this time around. Pretty much every important face in your life, you needed to be drag kicking and screaming. I feel so much pressure to like not do the thing that I know will make everything. Does it feel more real, what you've accomplished, what sort of has accomplished? I think it has to like end and years kind of have to, ha just in that, in that, um, the, the real, the weight of it, the impact of it, I, I feel like I'm living it for sure. I feel like I get really wonderful messages all, kind of all the time, but until, I mean, part of what I'm curious about is what happens after sort of, like, what are the shows that get made? Who gets to be heard? You know, I'm, I'm kind of looking out for that as well. You know, we talk so much about representation. I don't think that there have been many or any shows that have the same type of scope as sort of. What do you think, what do you hope that sort of will have achieved by the time it ends? Well, I, I think um, I love the tone of the show. I think that, I, I think, if there's a little bit more space for for shows to be a little bit weird in their tone or not, you know, so clearly boxed, like, I think that's kind of great for the world. And I think that, um, yeah, the kind of, the kinds of characters we were able to represent on the show and, and give nice, juicy arcs to. I, I think about actors in this, city, country, who are so deserving of really interesting, meaty stuff. So yeah, I, I, I just hope that, I just hope that, you know, it's, I just kind of want to be done with conversations around, we need chances, like I feel like we've proven ourselves over and over again that we can like totally tell stories. How have you been doing, Sally? I feel kind of corny saying this, but it's seriously fulfilling having you ask me that. It's just asking. I wasn't making fun of you. It's just feels nice is what I was trying to say. There are parallels between you and Sebi. What has your connection like with that character been like over time? Where is it now? What do you what do you feel about Sebi? You know, I've been asked like, has Sebi taught you anything or what are you kind of taking from from the character? And I, I think it's been such a pleasure, like truly to play somebody who's figuring a lot of stuff out. I feel like I, me, uh, personally, kind of grew up definitely faster than Sebi did, and um, I had career stuff kind of figured out really early on, and so it, it was nice to play someone searching, you know, and someone so flawed. I'm flawed too, obviously, I'm not, not perfect, um, but, but, um, so deliciously flawed and they make mistakes and they hurt people and they love people and yeah, I, it, it's, it, it, it meant a lot to, to play this character and to tell the story. What can I do for you right now? Anything you want. Can we go to the cinema? We can't ignore how important and impactful it is to see a non-binary person in a main role in the story that so artfully treats their journey. Okay. 
what do you hope to see in the future when we talk about other shows taking its place or other leadership? I don't know, like I think about uh, you know, the mentorship program we ran for trans and non-binary crew members on our set for the last two years, and I'm like, you know, so much can be achieved if trans people are given the respect and dignity that they deserve, and, you know, I, I, I want that. I want that for all of us forever, all the time. Um, so hopefully, hopefully we can be an example where, like, if you, if you treat... <laughs> I mean, it's so basic, but if you if you treat people well, um, it 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 gets the, that quality that that feeling gets embedded in the project, and it's a nice, lovely thing to be really proud of. Um, yeah, I just hope I just hope that more chances are taken, and and when those chances are taken, people are actually wondering, well, how can we support this person to do their jobs, their job to the best of their ability. So, Jackson, on the show, uh, mm -hmm. the character Savvy has, has trouble explaining to their family who, mm -hmm. who they really are. Is it your sense that there are parallels with Bilal's family? I mean, I've spoken with them about specifically this in multiple interviews. They've twice admitted to me that their relationship with their parents was in the past distant, still distant now. Now, when they were making this show, they wanted to have a hopeful, aspirational kind of interpretation of that relationship, even if it's not exactly like that in real life. But they did say that... Things are getting better, and they do hope that with some patience, some time, some grace, that their real life can reflect the ending of the show. All right. Well, well better is good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Jackson, thanks very much. <laughs> thanks.